all month long we've been going inside some of the most haunted places in South Texas and to conclude our series we went to visit what was once called the most violent place in the Old West. Texas has it all from the Dallas Cowboys to country music and even some pretty evil cities in between so let's check those out. Starting off our list today we have the city of Dallas which in the late 1990s was home to the infamous eyeball killer Charles Frederick Albright born in Amarillo in the year 1933. He grew up troubled with a knack for taxidermy and an anger towards his parents for never buying him fake eyes to use in his projects and instead forcing him to sew buttons on his carefully curated glorified and gruesome stuffed animals. As he got older Albright became interested in adult activity and so he decided to procure the services of a professional. But she gave him an infection and he was pissed. A few years later on December 13th of 1990 his anger turned to action. He violated and killed a working woman before carefully and completely removing her eyes from the sockets. Two months later another worker was discovered missing her eyes and a month after that a third. Eventually a tip led police to Albright but despite evidence found in his truck linking him to all three killings he was only only charged with the death of his first victim. He was sentenced to death for his crimes and was executed in August of 2020. Next up we've got the head hacker of Houston, Texas of course, a man or men responsible for the deaths of five women in Houston during 1979. The first death to occur that year was a woman found dead in her home tied to her bed with a pillow covering her face or at least that's what Bob Smith who found the body thought. Unfortunately Unfortunately for him and the victim Elise Elaine Rankin, when he lifted the pillow he quickly realized that her head had been hacked off and signs of forced adult activity were also present on the victim. Two weeks later another corpse was found in the same building just two floors up. Mary Michael Calcutta who was found in her bedroom fully clothed with her throat cut open had intact though. That same day Doris Lynn Threadgill was found dead inside her townhouse, her throat cut so badly that her her head was almost completely separated from her body. A few months later, Joan Huffman was found dead in a local park, and on the same day, a man named Robert Sprangenberger was found inside the trunk of a white Dodge car with his head completely removed from his shoulders. Whether or not the killings were done by the same person or a group of people working together, or perhaps they had nothing to do with each other at all, remains a complete mystery to this day. Next up, we have Irving, Texas. The the setting of a Taco Bell robbery gone wrong which took place back in 1991. On January 6th of that year, two men, Jesse San Miguel and Jerome Green, forced their way into the local Taco Bell and then forced four employees into the restaurant's walk-in freezer. Miguel and Green then ransacked the establishment, emptying all the registers and shoving anything valuable they could find into bags. Initially, the two had agreed that neither one of them were going to cause any harm to the employees, but before they left, Sam Miguel had a change of heart. He returned to the walk-in freezer and asked the four victims to give him a good reason why he shouldn't kill them before firing at and killing them one by one at close range. Miguel and Green then fled the scene, but they were arrested arrested just a few hours later. Miguel was sentenced to death and executed on June 9th of 2000 and Green was sentenced to 50 years behind bars. Next up we have Yorktown, home of the former Yorktown Memorial Hospital where at least 2,000 people died over the years due to both physical and mental illness, gross mistreatment, self-inflicted injuries, and purposefully inflicted injuries. The hospital opened its doors in 1951. By 1990 it was completely abandoned but it was later reopened by the city to be some kind of dark and twisted tourist attraction. Here's the thing, during the time the hospital was running, like I said, patients were grossly mistreated. In one instance, a one Dr. Lean Norwierski purposefully slit open a patient's throat while performing a procedure. In many other instances, patients were denied food or access to proper care for physical injuries as well as the mental ailments that led them to becoming imprisoned in the facility 
facility in the first place. Today, the ghosts of the deceased patients are said to vengefully roam the halls of the former hospital. I don't blame them. Not only that, but the ghost of a particularly cruel nun known to torment the patients who worked on the ground is also said to inhabit the building, punishing those wearing unacceptable hospital clothes and sporting tattoos by pushing them, scratching them, or forcing them out of the building. Next up, we have Childress, Texas, which between 1988 and 1991 became infamous for a series of assumed satanic based crimes. The first death to occur in the town was that of Tate Roland, who was found dangling from a tree. Police ruled that Tate had taken his own life despite his friends and family insisting that there was no way that could be the case. But police suspicions did begin to rise when Tate's sister, Terry Trosper, was found dead in her bed after having choked on her own vomit after ingesting substances used to treat anxiety and major depressive disorder. Rumors had been flying around town that Tate had been a member of a local satanic cult, and one person claimed that they had even seen the young man eating a Bible. And the suspicions of his involvement in dark worship only grew after his funeral, which was attended by unknown people who were heard chanting under their breaths during the service. Soon after, a friend of Tate's deceased sister Terry was also found dead with a note that read, I know something that the cops don't know. I know who killed Terry. I can't live anymore. After the new information, police re-autopsied Tate's body and found that he had ingested the same substance as Terry prior to his death. And a closer inspection of Terry revealed that she had been violated before her death. Although the police now fully believed that foul play was clearly a factor in the two deaths of the brother and sister, no arrest was ever made. But authorities did put out pamphlets outlining what to look for in cases of ritualistic killings. Next up, we've got the Lubby's Cafe killings, which took place in Killeen, Texas. On October 16th of 1991, George Hennard drove his pickup truck right through the window of Lubby's Cafeteria in Killeen, Texas before open firing on patrons of the restaurant, which resulted in the deaths of 23 people. When police arrived, he entered into a violent standoff with the officers. He fired, they fired, and Hennard became badly injured. He was instructed to stand down, but he didn't, and instead he turned the weapon on himself and took his own life. Police found a movie ticket stub for the Fisher King, uh, and the fact that his actions closely mirrored the events of the film are what led authorities to believe that he was inspired by the film to do what he did. When Harry entered the restaurant, he screamed, all the women of Killeen and Belton are vipers. And then he began firing at people while ranting and making snide remarks. Surprisingly, however, despite his intense hatred towards women, he was a known womanizer, he did let a mother and daughter flee the scene before beginning his spree. Next up, Mount Pleasant, Texas, of course. On May 10th of 1982, three Pizza Hut employees Howard McLean, Shirley Thompson, and Greg Dwayne Landrum were killed during a robbery gone wrong. The trio were closing up the restaurant when Calvin Paget and Max Daughtry entered the establishment demanding money. The problem was there was only $100 in the register. Paget and Daughtry became enraged and in a fit of anger fired a projectile at McLaughlin, fired at and beat Landrum, and fired at, beat and impaled Thompson all to death. When police arrived at the scene, the bodies of the deceased were found stashed away in the restaurant's storage area. Both Daughtry and Paget were eventually arrested. Daughtry received 30 years in prison for causing the death of Landrum, and Paget received two life sentences for causing the deaths of both Thompson and McLaughlin. Next up, we have the pure evil that took place in Austin, Texas, all the way back in the early 1880s. On December 30th of 1884, a black female house worker was found dead on a patch of snow in the city. She had been impaled in the stomach, chest, arms, and legs before being struck in the head with an axe. A few months later, on May 7th of 1885, another black houseworker was found dead, struck in the head 
with an axe. After that, Irene Cross was found dead after being impaled several times with a large blade. Her death was then followed by the death of Mary Ramey, who was violated before being impaled through the ear, and the next was Gracie Vance and Orange Washington beaten to death. All of the women fell under the same description. They were all black and they were all house workers. After that, the killings did die down, but no one was ever convicted for the deaths of the women. It is believed, however, that a fellow worker, Nathan Elgin, might have committed the crime, as it was confirmed that he was in close proximity to where most of the crime scenes during the time in which the killings would have taken place. Unfortunately, investigators were never able to question Nathan as he was killed while trying to attack a woman with a large blade. Next up, up we have San Antonio home to the angel of death, Janine Jones, who was anything but an angel. Jones was adopted at birth by a nightclub owner and a former beautician. There was not much else known about her upbringing, but what is known is that eventually she became a nurse, working at the Medical Center Hospital located in San Antonio. At one point, her co-workers described her as intelligent but coarse and prone to making loud and lewd jokes. I would assume if they were asked to describe her now, they might use harsher language. In 1983, Jones was arrested and charged with killing a young woman in her care by injecting her with a toxic amount of muscle relaxant. She was sentenced to 90 years in prison. The following year, she was given another 60 years after being charged with the attempted killing of another patient, which forced authorities to take a more in-depth look into all of the deaths that occurred in the hospital during Jones's time working as a nurse which revealed that over 60 patients Jones had access to died between the years of 1981 and 1982. In an interview with police, Jones said that it wasn't her that killed them, but rather the voices in her head. In 2019, Jones was taken to trial, once again charged with the deaths of five more patients. It is likely that with new evidence coming to light each and every day, Jones will be spending the rest of her life being pinballed back and forth between both the courthouse and her prison cell. And finally, to finish us off today, we have Beaumont, Texas, where in 2010, a man named Greg Flanagan took his final breath. On September 15th of that year, Flanagan was found dead on the floor of his hotel room. At first, it appeared as though he had died of natural causes, but upon closer inspection, it was revealed that was not the case. Coroners found broken ribs, massive damage to internal organs, a small cut on his frontal private area, and a blunt force injury consistent with injuries that generally occur in the event of a high-speed car crash. But his body showed no signs of bruising. It was truly baffling. The police followed many leads, but each one soon became a dead end. It wasn't until a private investigator was brought in that the case was finally solved. Greg Flanagan was killed after a projectile fired from a handheld weapon from the next room over went through the wall and entered Greg's body through his private area. That's what caused the cut, I suppose. But by then, Greg's body had already been cremated, so no further investigation could be done in that sense. However, police managed to track down the men staying in the room next to Greg the night of his death. Uh, they caved when they were questioned, they confessed, and the case was finally solved. All right, you guys, a lot going on in Texas, more than just bachelor and bachelorette parties. Uh, if you guys know of any other creepy, dark, evil, disturbing stories that took place in Texas, or anything else interesting, let me know in the comments. I'll be sure to check them out. I've been your host, Hannah Thompson. I'll see you next time.